I've been a photographer my whole life and a professional photographer for most of my career. I started out as a photojournalist and moved to being a chief photographer and director of photography with a staff of about 13 photographers. And as a, as a chief photographer and director of photography, I did a lot of teaching, lots and lots of teaching of newcomers and uh, adding skill sets as technology changed to professional photographers. So I've got quite a, quite a background that way. Also, I taught at Chabot College and De Anza College teaching photography, film, both film and digital photography and Photoshop. Worked at PeopleSoft, which was a quite a career change going into software, but I also managed the Adobe Photoshop relationship with uh, for PeopleSoft. And uh, as it, during that time, I became a, uh, an Adobe certified Photoshop instructor. So uh, since then I've been teaching at, since for the last 12 years at least, I've been teaching photography classes at uh, Fremont School, uh, Fremont <laughs> Parks and Recreation, the Fremont Recreation Department. And I taught photography classes in the studio that I had until a couple of years ago where I taught 200 different, 200 class sessions over time with a meetup group with 2,000 members in my meetup group. They, they loved me and I was very pleased with all of that. And as you can see, I'm quite humble. Thank you for <laughs> inviting me. <laughs> Thank you for inviting me and I hope to add something, add a little bit of creative, a creative nudge to your, to your uh, quiver tonight. Great. Thank you very much. And the topic tonight is what still photographers well, can use from cinematographers. So that sounds really intriguing. What can we learn from the movies? So take it away, Len. Uh, this looks pretty boring. I understand that. I can, I can figure that out. But I just wanted to go over uh, the basic flow. The basic flow here is when we start from the sensor over here on the left, on our left, uh, the image hits the sensor, the light hits the sensor, and it goes from the sensor into the internal raw processor where it's made into a database, where it's made into a database of information. The processor can then send the information out through a set of uh, prepared presets, which include the color balance that's set for the camera, the dynamic range that's set. Uh, it converts a 16-bit image into an 8-bit image. And then the user presets, any of the any user instructions that are added into what the compute what the pro, what the image should look like for example a uh, soft focus black and white image or a or a, a sepia image or maybe no preset at all then the compression level for the image is set and the image size is set and that passes over as a jpeg into the memory card so now we have a JPEG in the memory card. The raw processor can also pass that information directly from the database as a raw file to the memory card. So it can be either or, either a JPEG or a database raw file, or it can be both. Your camera can, many cameras can be set to store both uh, JPEGs and RAW files at the same time. In the cinema, however, the cinema workflow is slightly different, but not terribly. In, the, in cinematography, that you have the, of course, the cinematographer's vision, and, and that gets fastened onto the video sensor. But the vi vision is, gee, this is what I'm expecting. And now I'm going to put what re what's real onto the video sensor. This is very much like a photographer, very much like still photographer. And again, same thing. It goes to the internal, from the sensor, it goes to the internal raw processor. And then also 
can go out as raw video. This is pretty unusual. It's, it's extremely unusual in consumer type cameras. Raw video is very unusual in consumer type cameras. Professional ca cinema cameras, however, can do this, uh, have been doing this for some years now. The internal raw processor, usually for, for consumer grade cameras or semi-professional cameras, I should say, uh, the less expensive consumer cameras do not do do not have this stuff. In any case, from the raw processor, it sends the image data through what can be picture, what can be called picture profiles. And picture profiles have names like Cine and HLG3 and S-Log2 and S-Log3. And there's a whole bunch of them or none. The cinematographer can choose to have no picture profile applied. And that's the JPEG. It's, it's the same as the JPEG output uh, for still cameras. That's passed to the memory card. Then the, the cinematographer puts, puts it into the computer and then into the video editor. But then here's where it kind of gets different. If there's a picture profile in use, in the video editor, the cinematographer will choose a lookup table, a lookup table. And that lookup table takes the weird looking, uh, many of these like S-Log2 and S-Log3 look horrible when you look at them on your computer or in your video editor when you first see them. They look horrible, absolutely horrible. So. Down here is where they get fixed into a neutral image, which would be the correspond to the JPEG that's put out by a still camera. So we finally made it back to the JPEG. These are used to give expanded dynamic range without having to have a raw photo or raw video. That's what the picture profiles are for expanded dynamic range. We'll talk about that in a little bit maybe. But so finally we have a neutral image with the that contains a rendition of the, the proper dynamic range. And then the color grading begins and we have vision completion. There is a different, uh, the, I guess the difference I wanna point out is that from the vision of the cinematographer to this point, the cinematographer is aware the whole time that the image that comes out of the camera, the image that comes out of the camera is not the image the cinematographer wants. The, the, the cinematographer has this vision that includes color grading and all movies, all movies have a color graded, a color tint to them, uh, color blends that are not seen in nature and not seen in the original scene. They have to do with mood and storytelling. So there's a couple, a couple of exposure tips, exposure guidelines that I'd like to talk to you about. And those exposure guidelines include something called false color. And this is a tool that cinematographers use and that, that teaches still photographers a pretty strong and, and stern lesson, I think. In this false, when we look at the, some false color in a, min, in a minute or so, a couple of minutes, what's interesting about it is here are various reflection or brightness levels, 100% brightness level. Oh, look, that corresponds to zone 10. And over here, we have a 0% brightness level, and that corresponds, obviously, to zone 0. That's easy enough to figure out. But then Ansel, Ansel Adams, by the way, this is the... Uh, converting the Atomos Ninja to Adams' zone system. Ansel Adams is famous as the uh, photographer of the Sierra, 
the Sierra Nevada. He, he has long since passed, but his gallery remains and his fame also remains. So one of the most famous photographers in America and a black and white photographer and also a, a chronicler of the methods that he used to, to get his wonderful pictures. He was the first to chronicle these kinds of me methods for film, film exposure and film development. So film exposure meant that what we're going to wind up with is a black in the picture and a white somewhere in the picture. And this is what cinematographers shoot for too. But it gets pretty tiresome though when you, when you start talking to people about, oh, zone five is this and zone six is, is average skin and sunlight. And yeah, do people really want to talk about that? Uh, no, they don't. Of course they don't. But there's a lesson here. And the lesson is that instead of using numbers, they're using in false color, they're using color tones and they display the image in discrete color tones as opposed to continuous color tones. They break up the image into all these ranges and then assign a brightness to a color. And what I'd like to encourage you to do is to think in terms also of assigning a brightness in here to your exposure scale in the camera. That's the, what you see in the viewfinder. These are brightnesses that you can easily see in the viewfinder. And we can assign these to brightnesses in the viewfinder. So let's, uh, let's go on a little bit further. Step one, always, 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 as soon as you start getting ready to take a picture is if you went, as soon as you're ready to take a serious picture, you switch, you might switch out of automatic white balance. Cinematographers don't usually use automatic white balance, but if you're, if you're walking about, and I've, I've said this many, many times in my classes, when you're walking about, you take advantage of some of the automatic features in the camera, including automatic white balance, and you set your camera to P for program. P for program. So I lift up the camera and I uh, take a picture in P for program, or I point the camera at something, I take a picture for, in P for program. This is a picture that is in the, the scene is in the Olive Hyde Art Gallery at 123 Washington uh, Boulevard in Fremont, right at the intersection of Mission and Washington. It's a local artists, it's local, the name of the show is Local Talent. And so local artists are exhibiting here. This globe is about a foot and a half in diameter. This globe face is about a foot and a half in diameter. Fun stuff, interesting. I recommend you go see it. So I want to establish a really good white balance here. So I take a couple of cards that I got. These are Fomito and I put it out in front of the camera like this. And oh, look, it's at 2900 degrees Kelvin now. So I use the controls to set the white balance. And when I push the set button, the white balance indicator says, oh, this is where we're going to get the white balance from. And so it does, it captures the white balance, blacks out the screen. Now it's captured the white balance and it moved it from 2,900 to 3,200 K. I don't know if we caught that, but we can see here that it, it went from 2,900 K to 3,200 K. So it didn't, it didn't change by much, but it did change some. So we're at 3200K. The next step is to get the brightness right. The image is obviously too dark. And look over here at the histogram. The histogram is, has made it only a little, slightly more than halfway across the data display. So we know the image is very dark and we know it's too dark. It's going to be too dark. So 
Now, the next step for the cinematographer, and this is one I strongly recommend for everybody, for everybody, is you get a that white card out in front. And actually, we don't have to run right out to uh, the store to buy a white card. And we don't have to run over to Amazon right away to get a white card, these foamy toe cards. Oh, look. Look what works. A hunk of crumpled up. There I am up here in the... In the... Uh, people display I, I can I can do this for a second here oh stop sharing for a second oh here I am so just a piece of crumpled up white printer paper I keep I keep crumpled up pieces of white printer paper in my camera bag So here we, now, but I also keep this in my camera bag. Crumpled up paper in my pocket too. So then an interesting fact about cinematographers is their shutter speed, which is down here, it says a 50th of a second. Their shutter speed is determined most of the time by the frames per second that they're shooting their video in. So if they're shooting at 24 frames per second, which is a typical video speed, video frame per second, then they use a 50th of a second shutter speed, a 50th of a second. So, and that's, that, they, that's done universally. The shutter speed is the, num the denominator, the bottom number on the shutter speed is twice the frames per second number. So 24 frames per second would mean a 48th or a 50th of a second shutter speed. The other thing they do is they decide on an aperture. What aperture are we going to be using? And usually it's 5.6 or 8. Whoa. So they've decided in advance what the aperture is going to be. They've determined what the shutter speed has to be. That doesn't leave much room to play with. So the way they manipulate things is with ISO. So here we've got ISO set to 320, and now I'm pushing it up to 500, 640, 800, 1,000, 1,250, 1,600. And we're just about there, 2,500, look at that. Oh, these are called zebras, zebra stripes. This means that it's overexposed, we're losing white detail, we're losing detail on the highlights. So the next step is to back off some because we don't want it to be that bright. So we go from 2,500 to 2,000, we still got if we go to 20, from 2,500 to 2,000, we can still, if you watch right here, we can still see some zebra activity in there. So we get rid of that by coming back down to 1,600. And this is the, this is the ISO that we're going to use to shoot the picture. Another way it's done is with this. These are pretty popular. This is the uh, passport size color checker, color checker, color check. This one is the color checker video. It has these three panels in it, in addition to the, in addition to the uh, color chips. So we can put this white panel in the picture also, and we manipulate the ISO the same way up to 2000 and it's too hot and bring it down to 1600. And now the scene looks just fine. And he said, just fine, except we see a few zebras still here. Those are specular highlights. Specular highlights are going to yield that those are actual reflections of the light source. And it's really difficult and sometimes inappropriate to 
uh, reduce those to where they don't have zebras in them. Now, I want to give you a little advice uh, and uh, a little advi advice here. The it looks blown out in the background, but I'm photographing a screen on a, from a camera with another camera. So that I'm doing a video of the LCD screen, which is which means I'm going to lose lo lose lots of dynamic range. But also, please notice. Down here is the histogram. It, it has flattened out a lot. That doesn't mean much, uh, but the, the shape of the histogram means nothing. This is what's important in the histogram. Did we make it to the bottom right corner? So I used these funky methods like this card and this card to set exposure. And what I wound up with here is a perfect histogram, my, my. So I'll just pat myself on the back for that. So that's how it's done. That's how it's done using a white card. Now, same thing here. I'm at the Shin Park, Shin Historical Park and Arboretum, also in Fremont. And I've got the histogram displayed here. The, again, the highlights look burned out because again, I'm photographing an LCD screen. The video is actually of an LCD screen, so it's lower in quality and the dynamic range isn't what it should be. So the histogram shows me that I'm over to the right and, and I'm in great shape. I don't have anything right up against the right because I don't have anything that's truly white in the image. I have light, very light gray uh, concrete here, but that's not pure white. So I don't have any pure white here. Histogram looks great. On the front of the lens, I've got a variable neutral density filter, which is another way cinematographers use to get the ISO that they need. I'm down at a much lower ISO here, like ISO 50, and I've got a 50th of a second still, an F4, I'm still using that. But now I start to turn the filter on the front. And of course I can just wipe out the image using the neutral density filter, I can uh, I can regulate the exposure hitting the film. On my screen up here, I can see just a little bit of blue left over. And here this spike is actually these things. This spike is representing these letters here on the screen. So the screen is mostly black with a few grains of a few grains of pixels of uh, brightness here and the lettering. So, and that, then when I turn the filter back the other way, of course, the scene brightens up again and I'm over toward the right. This is what that thing looks like to the camera. I was looking at the LCD screen. And while I was looking at the LCD screen, the camera was making a video and oops, so this is what the scene looks like. Now I add this to the scene, I'm sorry. I add this to the scene and this that you're looking at now is actually through the video camera. This is another kind of color checker card. It has much, it has much bigger color sampling squares on it so that it's easier to see on this screen, easier to see in this, in this program. When I, operate the when I operate the turn when I rotate I'm sorry when I rotate the variable neut neutral density filter you can see that we go from ordinary brightness to completely black now this is false color I started to tell you about the false color I can set my LCD monitor 
to a false, not on the camera, but as an external monitor, I can set it to a false color setting so that it shows me false colors. And what you, what you see here is almost nothing in terms of gradations. It's just broken up into these zones. Down here at the bottom right is zero on this, in this color scheme, going up through 50% middle gray, and then over 100, over 100. So, and the mustard color is 100, then yellow is 90 and so forth. So what we saw just a second ago was the bottom row in this card goes from white through light gray to black. And when we look at the false color, we see the bottom row going from white to black. But because of the exposure that I'm giving through that variable neutral density, this is an orange here that there's over 100. So this is way too bright. But now I start to turn down the brightness using the neutral density filter and look what happens to that bottom row. This one, which is white, is now starting to get mustard colored. So we're, it's going from 100, it's going from over 100 to 100, which is, it should be somewhere in the neighborhood of 100. And so now as we move the card, move the filter, I should say, a little bit brighter, or I'm sorry, darker, I should say, we see that that far left square has now become 100. And this square is now at 50% gray. This is exactly where this square should be. So now we are, this is the correct exposure for this scene. This is the correct exposure. And this is how videographers do it. I'm going to say, videographers are going to say, oh, this brightness right here should be 50. It should be this gray color. Whereas photographers are going to look at that and say, that should be zone five. Zone five is the perfect middle setting. It's the zero setting in your cameras, in the, uh, in the viewfinder and on the, on the scale, the brightness scale or the exposure scale. So as we change the, as we continue to shift, now it's completely black. The, well, not quite, but it's mostly black because the neutral density filter has been turned all the way to its darkest setting. And now we start to turn it back the other way and we see all the colors shifting through. This is kind of, kind of funny here. If we watch only the middle gray, watch this guy right here, the middle, look at the color shift through that until it's just, until it's 100%. So that this is as bright as my filter will let through at ISO 100. Once you've got your white balance figured out and how to do your exposure, you've got that figured out. You move along to scene selection, scene selection. And uh, it's important to think in terms of the first right answer. <laughs> we, co we come upon a scene and we see something and we say, oh, that's beautiful. What's important is what uh, all the directors of photography do, and that is they move about the scene. They'll take a look at a scene and they don't stop at the first right answer. They'll do, in fact, they have formulas. It's amazing how much, how many formulas there are for how to do things in the movies. They have establishing shots and close-up shots and uh, we'll, we'll take a look at a, a bunch of different categories of shots for 
taking pictures, taking scenes with people in them. But it's all, all of the movies fit into these formulas. It's amazing. It's just amazing. But so here's an establishing shot that, t that tells us basically what are, what this room looks like. And we go from the establishing shot to a detail shot. This this is back this is back in this alcove here. We go to a detail shot, another detail shot. And so we have an establishing shot and a couple of detail shots. This is a way to approach a room like this. And you discover little things like the chamber pot under here. This is the this is at the Patterson House at Ardenwood Farm, Ardenwood Historic Farm. And I give tours at the Patterson House every Sunday. So if you want to come by and find out more about the Patterson House, please do. This is the stairway in the Patterson House. Wow, what a great shot of the stairway. What I mean, what a, what a great stairway, wonderful stairway. But again, work around the scene. We've got that establishing shot. Here's what the stairway looks like overall. And then here are some detail shots of the stairway. Like so, giving di different points of view, different points of view. So the scene selection then moves Again, this is the Meek Estate in Hayward, the stairway for the Meek Estate in, Hay in Hayward. And this, this stairway has some wonderful different ways to look at it. From straight on, and there's a profile shot of the stairway. And then there's this from the stair tread itself, looking up the stairway. And then... <laughs> I'm kind of partial to this one. It's it's like the reverse vertigo almost. And so we're looking up the stairwell instead of down the stairwell. So different points of view on the same thing. Now, this is a set of blocking tips. Blocking is the path that the actors take through the scene. How are the actors going to move through a scene or set? And how is the camera going to move through the scene or set? And blocking, there are blocking diagrams. It, the block, the word blocking comes from the original practice of using wooden blocks on a model stage to block out the actions of a stage play. And so the uh, the author of the play or the and or the director of the play would use little wooden blocks to move things around on a model stage to figure out just exactly how things were going to work and how they would look to the audience. So we do the same they do the same thing in video. So what does this have to do with stills though? Um, number two let the actors show you what they want to do first. And then when you're ready to act, it's based on some knowledge that you have. Let the actors show you what they want to do first. And then where the camera is placed is determined by what's important in the scene. It's, it's determined by what you have seen. So blocking is like a puzzle. Directors need to keep working at it until it works. And the last one we can skip for now, or we, we don't have to take pay attention to that one in particular. But these, these three right here, let the actors show you, figure out where the camera belongs, and keep working at it until it works. Ah, so here, here is some blocking. We know where the water is. So that's one of the actors in this scene. And we know where the camera is going to be. We set the camera according to the background and the water. And then we wait for the birds to arrive. There are lots of pictures from Michael Lee. He's a marvelous photographer. Most of these are also, these pictures are also done at the Patterson House. There's a fountain outside the Patterson House and we get lots and lots of 
different kinds of birds playing and bathing and drinking at the fountain. And the hummingbirds are out there spearing water drops in midair, like so, like so. Focus on a spot and wait. Here again, this is another photographer in a different scene. And here is a bird feeding its young and the young is sitting just outside the nest and the photographer waits. When the mother comes or the parent comes to feed the bird, the blocking is done. The photographer knows where the characters are going to move through the scene. Blocking is done. Blocking in this one is really simple and it's mostly patience, but we've got the nest. Again, the hummingbird, blocking is done. Terrific close up, wow. Blocking, we've got the uh, a spot where the skaters repeatedly emerge from the from the wells, the concrete wells. They re jump. They do this jump repeatedly as they're practicing, getting better and better at it. So you just wait. You set up the camera, set up the focus, wait for the athlete. So that's a matter of observation. You observe, anticipate, and be patient. Same thing, observe, anticipate, be patient. You know where the action's going to happen. It's going to happen right there in the flame with this glass worker. Let's talk a little bit, a little bit about lens selection also. Uh, cinematographers and still photographers use lenses in lots of different ways, but I want to briefly go through uh, the, the dolly zoom effect, which was the dolly zoom was named after a process that Alfred Hitchcock used to great advantage in the movie Vertigo. And it's been used since then in, several, in many, many other movies. The dolly zoom is a camera, a lack of camera movement actually, where, or a lack of subject movement, I'm sorry, where you have the main subjects and then the distance from the camera to the main subject varies, but the distance from the main subject to the background doesn't vary. This is a fixed distance. The house is X number of feet from these two characters in front of the house. And we've got a wide angle lens here, and that includes the whole house. So now we narrow down the angle of view just a little bit, moving from very wide to not quite so wide. And look, the house looks closer to the main characters, but the camera moved back. We zoomed the lens a little bit or we changed the focal length, but the characters didn't change much in size. The house did. And this is where the dolly zoom comes in, the concept of dolly zoom. I also call it the feet zoom. You move your feet while you zoom the lens. If you start here and then you back up a little bit, you back up a little bit and zoom a little bit, the background gets bigger, elements in the background get bigger, and there's not as many elements. You see, we lose a tree over there on the right, nice tall tree standing up part of the tree on the left is gone it's just gone the peaks of the roof gone so we don't have as many elements but the elements that are left are bigger again same thing not as many elements but the elements that are left are bigger so we can see the background changing significantly but the characters in the foreground don't change significantly until finally We've got all, all that's left is the archway leading into the main doorway. So lens selection helps to, the lens focal length selection controls the background. So the distance of the, from the photographer to the subject, the main subject control is used to control the size of the main subject. The lens focal length is used to control the look of the background. 
there's another set of definitions, and this is one of the, this is something I started to touch on earlier. This formula right here, full shot, medium shot, cowboy shot. Gee, why would they call that the cowboy shot? Maybe because this is where the guns are hanging, right here. So the cowboy shot includes the guns. And then we go to the medium shot, medium close up, right through the right through the middle of the chest here, the close up and the extreme close up. These are used in almost every movie and they're used for emotional effect and they're used for a sense of sh sharing in here, sharing the actor's experience. And these things are, the wider ones are used for observing, more, more used for observing the actor's actions. So let's take a look. Extreme close up. Here's Len working on his view camera out at the Shin house. A little further away, through the chest, at the waist. Now, each one tells us a little bit more about the character. We don't know much about what's going on here, and we don't know much about the character except that he's an old guy with white hair or gray hair. Looks like he's fooling with a camera. And oh, look at that, he has some kind of a vest on. That's, a, that's definitely not an ordinary garment. So he's serious about something, he's technical. Also, there's a growth of beard here. So you know, he's kind of casual about this whole thing. Yeah, that's a vest, all right. And now we start to see the pockets and oh yeah, that's a view camera. How cool is that? And wow, look at his pockets. Pockets in his jacket are full, the pockets on his trousers are full. Holy smokes, he's carrying a lot of junk. Ah, even the cargo pocket in his jeans, in his pants is full. Look at that. He's carrying way too much stuff. And then finally the full length. Oh, flood pants. <laughs> he's wearing flood pants. So he's the kind of guy that wears flood pants. So we learn a little bit more. I, I pulled, I, my, my wife was taking these pictures of me and she was wondering what I was doing when I was rolling up my trousers at the bottom. I finally had to tell her, well, it's the flood pants punchline. So, okay. So here we, we have, we're seeing a little bit more about the character each and every time And that shows the range of shots. Now, uh, in my career, of course, I use the wide angle. I use them all. I use all the lenses thoroughly. The most used lens in cinematography and movie making, the most used lens is a 28 millimeter lens. This is not a 28. This is a much wider lens. But the most used lens is a 28. And the most used aperture, most used apertures are f5.6 and f8. We see a lot of people worrying about f1.4 f apertures. And I recently read an article where the author of the article was saying that these super wide apertures giving the extreme shallow depth of field and very fuzzy bokeh. It's a dead giveaway that it's a newbie videographer working on a shoestring budget. <laughs> a little tiny budget and inexperienced uh, videographer. So that kind of that kind of made me nervous because uh, I don't have a big budget and I'm not a I'm not actually a videography expert, but I do. You know, I have been studying it, so I'm not a videography expert. So I'm going to stick with f4 and f5, say, or f5, 6 and f8. Actually, it wasn't even f4 and f5, 6. The apertures are f5, 6 and f8. <coughs> Excuse me. So I talked about wide angle lenses minimize the size of the elements in the background 
but it shows a they show a wider view of the background. So that's one way to handle backgrounds. Let's take a look at what happens in the backgrounds here. We show a wider view of the background. So we've got some atmospherics and some trees. We've got a real wide view of the background here, but the, each element in the background is very small relative to the boat subject in the foreground. Elements in the background, the uh, again, a wide angle lens really exaggerates the size of this. Uh, I, get, I think this is Buddha's, a Buddha's finger lemon or a Buddha's, yeah, Buddha's fingers. Anyway, this uh, strange lemon that came off of that tree in the background. The wide angle lens really exaggerates it, although it was quite large to begin with. Again, exaggeration, minimizing the size of things in the background. Look at the size of this uh, pine cone relative to the telephone pole and the dog. Oh, a tiny dog relative to that back to that. Things fading into the background really fast. We've got foreground rebar, rebar and broken chips of broken chips of roadway bridge and fading into tiny little details in the background. Wow, big log, small lighthouse. Big big log, small lighthouse. The This was a ride in an ambulance in which this ambulance attendant, this EMT, extracted this piece of plastic during the ambulance ride, extracted this piece of plastic from the baby's throat. The baby was struggling, struggling, struggling during the ride. And the baby's mother was up front in the ambulance. And I was back here with the two of them. I was taking pictures. And the instant he pulled that piece of plastic out and the baby could breathe, the baby just fell sound asleep, gonzo. <laughs> All the tension just fell away asleep. It was quite a moment. Telephoto lenses, they bring things in the distance up closer. You don't see as wide a view. In fact, you can get a really narrow view, but they bring things up really close to the subject in the foreground. Again, a long, long lens, not as long as the last lens, the picture, the image in the la last image, but we're narrowing down. This was, a, this was a crowd. It was a crowd in an auditorium. And with a longer lens, I was able to narrow it down to three principal characters. Again, this is an ov what in Hollywood or in videography in the, in the movie business, they call this an over the shoulder shot for obvious reasons. I'm looking right over the drill instructor's shoulder at Marines getting ready to go to uh, uh, go sailing off to Iraq. Again, long lens, we eliminate a lot of the boring stuff in the background, you know, like firefighters just kind of standing around not doing much of anything after the fire is pretty much out. Ray Maker, he built the railroad, built the small scale railroad in Hayward's, uh, the, the park next to the airport in Hayward uh, on Hesperian. And he did it single-handedly. <laughs> Here's this guy that's even older than I am now. And there's traffic, there's parked cars and all kinds of stuff all around him while he's working. So I used a long lens to narrow it all down and is isolate him as much as possible. Again, a long lens bringing these two ladies up nice and close to the to bars and the windows. Wiping out the background, getting rid of the background altogether using a long lens. Long lens, timing. Long lens and timing. Here the long lens puts the background out of focus, but not so badly out of focus. You can tell that those are dogs in the background, no, no problem at all. So it keeps the dogs in a setting but also isolates them at the same time. And here everything is in pretty close focus. This is more this is a more cinematic kind of approach. This little girl walking her dolly through the shopping center at Christmas shopping time. 
So this is when shopping centers actually, when uh, New Park Mall actually had traffic in the mall. Uh, that's that's a mean thing to say, huh? Anyway, this little girl is, is out shopping with her parents and a long lens helps to compress the crowd and make it look that much busier. Again, a long lens looking through the shrubbery. Long lens separating the subject from a cluttered kind of messy background without doing a lot of Photoshop. For you hear a lot about phony Photoshop pictures. Well, long lenses, shallow depth of field can help reduce the the sense that a photo has been badly photoshopped. So those are some of the sig those are the, some of the interesting things that I've found that have to do with film techniques that are transferable fairly easily to fairly easily to still techniques. Now I would like to revisit this one a little bit. And the reason I'd like to revisit this one is these zones right in here compared to, this is the zero. When I point my camera at something and I put the exposure indicator in the camera at zero, what I'm saying is, gee, this picture should be kind of, you know, middle gray. And that's what Ansel Adams said, that still photographs, black and white images, if you average out the values, the black and white values, the gray values in the picture, over a series of pictures, they'll all average out to zone five, middle gray. The photograph itself will average out, average out to middle gray. And so he and Kodak settled on zone five as the standard for the middle exposure value. That's where this comes from. Ansel Adams and Kodak uh, negotiating with Ansel Adams being pretty fierce in his desire to prevail. <laughs> Kodak folks had a little bit different idea, but Adams prevailed. Now, in digital, in digital, to get the absolute most bang for your buck, what you're looking for is much closer to this area here. So if you use a spot meter in your camera, or if you get really close to something that should be quite bright, very light in the picture, not white, but light in the picture you get, so it fills up your picture, fills up your viewfinder, then it should be on plus two. So your indicator will move from, when you see the whole scene, your indicator will be here, and then you get real close to something light and bright, and your indicator will creep over until it's on plus two. That's the right exposure for this. So you can use your manual exposure to set this to plus two if, when you're working with manual exposure. Find something bright, put it on plus two, find something bright, put it on plus two. That gives you the maximum bang for your buck using manual exposure with today's digital cameras. More, many, much more information is received and stored or passed along by the sensor in the very bright values than in the dark values. The dark values always pass on very little information. The bright values pass along a great deal of information. So that if you make bright things very bright in the picture, that will also bring the darkest things in your picture up. Usually it'll bring them up a little bit in value 
and give them less noise in the final result and better detail. So this is a whole great big subject and I've talked with the Fremont Photographic Society about the concept of exposing to the right in the past and exposing to the right means when you look at the histogram in your camera, it should be, you should have data over on this side. You should have stuff right up close to the right border. If you don't have stuff right up close to the right border, you're not using your sensor to its fullest. Even if the picture, even if the picture looks a little washed out on your LCD screen, even if the picture looks a little washed out, you want it to be over on the right side, not here, certainly not here. Oh, look, again, this looks washed out because this is a picture of the LCD screen, but here is the, here is the histogram for this image on the back of the camera, on the LCD screen of the camera that is taking the image. So here is the pay point right there. And videographers are religious about exposing to the right. They are religious about exposing to the right, particularly when they're using those wacky looking profiles that I was talking about over here, S-Log2 and S-Log3 and HLG, all of these really weird kinds of symbols emphasize very strongly exposing as much as possible to the right and making sure your histogram is well over there so that you get the maximum shadow detail and maximum, maximum highlight detail that your sensor can possibly produce. That's my presentation talking about what videographers have to offer us. And here is my presentation regarding, uh, here is a presentation regarding the Patterson House at Ardenwood Farm. And I sure hope to see you there. Let me stop the share. Thank you all very much for not uh, disappearing. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much, Len. That was very interesting and informative. Uh, I have one comment and one question, uh, and then I'll let other people uh, talk too. Uh, my comment is, is that uh, your description of uh, how you block a, a scene and also how you do establishing shots and, and other kinds of shots, if any of, of you are going to participate in the N4C portfolio competition, which is where you put together a sequence of images. I think a lot of what Len talked today is absolutely perfectly applicable to your, to your work and putting together a great, great portfolio. And I would definitely encourage you to take that to heart. And I would encourage you to put together a portfolio because it's a lot of fun. Uh, my question is, when you talked about the false color, uh, you said that you were doing that on a computer, not in the camera, but it seems like that's something you want to set up in the field. So how does how do how do you use that when you're actually trying to set up the camera? Uh, well, I, I, I actually what I said was it was an external monitor. Ah, okay. Uh, so you can you can buy battery operated field monitors that are specifically designed for cinematographers. There's there's lots and lots of them at a really wide price range from about 150 bucks to like a thousand bucks for these monitors. And the, you take the HDMI out of the camera, you plug a cord into that, and then you plug the other end of the that HDMI cable into this little monitor. As I say, the monitor is, is battery operated, but quite bright. Some of them are really easy to see in sunlight, much, much easier to see than your camera LCD screen. 
So you can see just what the LCD screen looks like, or you can see just the image. You can, with no data on it, just plain image that the camera is, is recording. You can also, uh, those weird S-Log3 and S-Log2, th those things, those, those uh, picture profiles, you can put LUT adjustments in these monitors so they can adjust the profiles so that you see the finish or output image perfectly, perfectly uh, tuned already. Uh, and they offer, of course, the uh, histogram, they offer waveforms, they offer numerous, numerous technical tools. And I thought about digging into those a little bit more, but I thought, nah, <laughs> just, just show the false color, which is fascinating enough. So you can just dial up on the monitor, the false color setting. And actually the most useful false color is skin tone. So you zoom in and get a close up on somebody's skin and you get the false color exactly right and the exposure is dead on. It is amazingly accurate. So using color instead of numerical values or history or positions of the histogram or anything else, it's false color is extremely accurate for skin. Fascinating. Uh, so any other questions for Lynn? I noticed that Stanley has unmuted himself. Do you want to ask a question? Oh, uh, yes, please. Yeah, I, if my, I'm using my laptop. If my voice is too low or too high, um, please let me know. Um, my question is about the cameras. Do you use, the first question is, do you use a dedicated video camera? Or if you use the today's camera, like R5 or Sony, or Sony high-end camera? Yeah. I, uh, of course, as a still photo, I was a still, I, I use Sony cameras, Sony mirrorless cameras. Mm -hmm. I was a still photographer for, for many years and used used and recommended Canon for many, many years. And then when uh, we switched over, when this great changeover to digital took place in the full frame cameras, I thought that Sony had the best bang for the buck in their sensors. And so I started with, I started working with Sony full frame cameras and I've been with Sony full frame cameras ever since. I still have some DSLRs, but the Sony mirrorless cameras, of course, are the only ones they're making now, and they are magic. <laughs> they are just plain magic. And a couple of them, a few of them, are superb, absolutely superb video cameras. One is primarily a video. One of the uh, one of the Sony mirrorless cameras, uh, full frame, is primarily a video camera, and only secondarily a stills camera. And then they have a couple of bodies that, that just don't have any, uh, any stills functionality at all, but they're still, just, they're still mirrorless cameras. They have almost no stills functionality and uh, are very much directed at the, at the videographer. So I don't use those, but I do use Sony full frame cameras and I have a couple of them that are very strongly emphasizing videography. Yeah, and the second question is, yeah, people say that when when they they use use still photography or video photography, they generate a lot of heat in the sensor. So is that the case? Or not, or if it is the case, you you heard the camera camera sensor. I'm not understanding the question. I'm sorry. So uh, I think uh, I think what he's asking is because I heard this myself, is that when you run a try to do video with a still camera, it can get very very hot. Is yes. that what you're asking for about still? Oh, yes, yes, that's correct. Yeah, thank you. 
<laughs> yeah, the the of course there, there's a a lot of comment online about in particular the A74, A7IV Sony. A lot of people talk about it getting hot. There are expert, there's some really good expert testimony, I should say, or ex expert testing online also that talks about the camera getting warm. And my, I have an A7 IV, and it does indeed get warm. Video is not the same as stills, and the video challenges the camera a great deal more. The, I'll, I'll tell you this, the monitors, I was talking about external monitors, the monitors get a whole lot hotter than the cameras do. The monitors are, they hurt. You touch the monitor after it's been working for about 15 or 20 minutes, it hurts to touch it. The mm. A7 IV, I, I wouldn't want to be hanging onto it tightly because it's, you know, it is very warm, but it, it's not, I wouldn't, I wouldn't really call it hot. I don't run it for hours at a time. I run it for perhaps a half an hour at a time, uh, but I've never had it get uncomfortably hot. It's, it's quite warm, but not not too hot to touch the monitor nope <laughs> you don't want to touch it twice mm. you'll, you'll learn that quickly so electronic stuff these days using a lot of power getting pretty hot the a7 IV the hot camera issue is I think overhyped there are ways to get around it and there's good advice on ways to get around it I'll I'm going to recommend an online advisor and his name you can look him up on youtube his name is gerald g-e-r-a-l-d undone u-n-d-o-n-e g-e-r-a-l-d u-n-d-o-n-e he has a lengthy report on the a74 because I definitely have seen, been with a person who says, oh, I never take video for longer than 10 minutes because the camera gets too hot. But you're saying you think that's overreacting. If they're, if they're concerned about the, the heat of the camera damaging the camera, yeah, that's overreacting. Mm -hmm. uh, if, I had, if I had to carry the camera in my hands, I'd be kind, of, you know, and that was the only way I had to carry it. I, I'd be concerned, you know, how, how am I going to do this? But there's a camera cage. I can attach the camera to a tripod and I can carry it by the tripod or a monopod. I can carry it that way. But I don't much care about the camera itself getting hot because it has a built in fuse, sort of, or a circuit breaker or whatever. It shuts itself down when it gets to a certain temperature. Mm. And there are two stages for, for those who are really nervous about it. There is the standard stage where the camera shuts down quite early, you know, after just a few minutes. And there is the, then there is the high temp stage. And that one allows the camera to get quite warm to the touch before it shuts it down. But again, it shuts down before it gets anywhere near what would damage, actually damage the camera. And it only shuts it down uh, under certain circumstances. You know, I had the camera out in uh, bright, hot sun and uh, the camera got a whole lot hotter uh, off. All of the black cameras get a whole lot hotter off in the bright sun than they do from operating with a battery, so. Mm -hmm. Any other questions for Len? Okay, well, let's thank Len. I think he's done a really excellent job and I certainly appreciate it. <laughs> thank you all. Thank yeah, you all. Thank you very much. Yes, thank and you. I, I think I learned something. Always, <laughs> oh, painful, always painful, but usually pleasurable too. <laughs> And right. I will be posting the recording uh, and I'll let all of you know uh, the link to that recording.
and all Great. the members of the club, I'll let them know. Okay. Again, thank you, Len. Appreciate you. You're your welcome. Time. You're thank welcome. You, Len. Always, a, always. You're welcome. Always a pleasure to be here. Thank you. It's what a very group. informational and very, very educational. Yeah. Thank yeah, you. I, I, I tend to be a fire hose. <laughs> that's okay. It's a, it's a good. It's a different point of view, and I think. Yeah. No, I thought your your rate of information transfer was was good. I, <laughs> a lot of it, but it wasn't overwhelming. Okay. Great. It. All right. Good night. Good night. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Thank you.